folks, and welcome to The Daily Coin. My name is Rory, and today is Thursday, May the 19th, 2016, and I am very honored and have the great pleasure of welcoming back to the show for another update, Mr. Louis Camarasano from smallgold.com. Louis, how you doing today? Rory, I'm doing grand. Well, I'm certainly glad you're here. I wanted to... We had said that we were going to follow up this week with the top miner mining countries and the top uh, silver mining producers, and that's exactly what we're going to do. I think we've got a little, some other stuff that we're going to cover as well. So, oh, you know, yeah. it's interesting. The thing that we, the email that we exchanged on uh, junk silver, th- there is an issue with each year especially during when the, the price goes up, they melt that stuff, which means we don't know how much is left. And that adds a kind of uncertain numismatic premium to junk silver. And the PCGS people, they try to do an estimate of how many Morgan dollars are left, how many pieces. Well, they know that in 1918, because of the Pittman Act, they melted about 350000 of the thing, $280,000. Uh, so they know those are gone. But they don't know which years they were taken from. Right. And then in the melt years, you know, when the price hit fifty dollars in the late seventies, early nineteen eighty, and of course two thousand eleven, a lot of the junk silver was melted down. And again, you don't know what was melted. You don't know how many dimes are melted. Whether they were predominantly the nineteen forties dimes, you don't know whether they were melting key dates or they were just dumped in the in the, in, hop into the crucible. The, yeah. <laughs> just so in that's and why. Fired up. I, and that's why I'm suggesting that junk silver, as because they don't make any more of it, as we go forward, may not be the same barometer as uh, as it used to be because there's just less of it. So it's not going to come to market in the same amounts because there's not as much of it to come to market because we don't know how much, but a good amount of it has been melted. Yes, and Which I do why understand say, that. Hold on to them. Hold on to those coins. Yes, and the. But my point is, is that, or the point that I was trying to make is, is that as 90% silver coin comes back into the market and it leaves the market, that is your, that's your, that's kind of, that gives you a, an idea of that silver is moving and it's, it's an indication of Absolutely. whether the market is tight or whether the market or whether there's plenty of uh, product available, because right. as the silver, as the 90% silver comes back into the market and people are selling it back in, then they're quite naturally, they're taking their rounds, their bars, their numismatics or whatever they've got, because it's hit either, it's either a hit a price point that is favorable to them or B they're broke. <laughs> and that's, that's it or, or both or both i mean and, that's, both. And, and to be perfectly honest i mean I, I i think i've told you this before i'm i meet with uh three four four coin dealers every month and mm-hmm. they're all local coin dealers and i ask them the same thing are people selling back into you and for the last probably year the answer's been no, and one of them two months ago was, he was like, dude, I haven't seen anything except for what I have right now. And he said, this guy came to me, and he had this whole set, and he was dead broke. And this right. was all that he had. And the guy, I mean, he had been collecting for a while because he had a really, he had some really nice uh, bars in particular. He had one bar that I've never, ever seen before, and it was a three ounce uh, Monarch loaf. And I've the never port, seen the port, the port silver Monarchs. Yep. yep. And it was, and it was beautiful. Needless to say, I snapped that up right away. <laughs> and uh, I mean, there was some Johnson and Matthew bars which aren't being made anymore that's right that's right and uh so any anytime i see stuff like that that's what i'm on the lookout for or those it's that kind of stuff i mean i got plenty of eagles eagles are like treasury bonds they're the most liquid most recognizable they're not necessarily the best value though right 
But as far as, you know, what I'm looking for to, to add to my stack, I mean, I, I want something that's beautiful, that's kind of different, you know, that has the potential to have some kind of premium mm-hmm. during my lifetime. So, well, you know, which ones are good for that? Are the when the Canadian the Canadian Mint does the special issues like the Wildlife Series or the Birds yep. of Prey? Yep. Those they make them in relatively limited mintages. They're still mm-hmm. silver maple leaves, but they have a kind of special mark on them or a special design. So they tend to get a premium. You know what else is? Is the America the Beautiful coins right? Yes. They make those in the twenty to fifty thousand fifty thousand mintages until recently. This year, the uh, Shawnee. National Forest, they minted over 100,000. And the second one, the Cumberland Gap, they minted about 64,000. But normally those things, even though those are very low numbers too. Very low but, numbers. But but normally, like in 2015, the whole series, they didn't make one over 50,000. And some wow. of the ones in the night, I think 2012, uh, they had mintages of 20, 30,000, which that's, is basically nothing. Yes, that's very low. Well, I mean, in the in the kookaburros and the koalas and the koalas, stuff. and uh, there's that other one also. The um, well, the kooks and the and the koalas that come out of the Perth man. I mean, they mm-hmm. were they were held at three hundred thousand forever. And, and the Chinese they, and, panda too. The Chinese silver the, panda's been capped at eight million. Well, now they've raised the on the kookaburros. They've raised that to a million. So now they're producing a million of those a year. I mean, even so, it's a good. And you know, the Silver Libertad, the Mexican one, rarely does a million. Yeah, you, that, yeah, we talked about that uh, during the last show. I mean, that was, uh, which was very surprising because Mexico's <laughs> number one silver producing country in the world, <laughs> and, they, and they don't save it. They don't save it for their own their own production. They ship that stuff out to India, probably, and. The United States and everywhere else, but they don't mint their own coins with it. It's crazy. And speaking of Mexico being the number one silver producing country in the world, All right. what else is the, who else would fall into the top 25 or the top 20? I know you did this, you did an article uh, last week uh, on this, Lewis, and we talked about it very briefly in our, in our last show. And who is, uh, I know Peru's in there, and I know that these guys are producing uh, silver hand over fist. So give us some numbers. <laughs> All right. So here's what's interesting. When I did my research, uh, you know, I do this assiduously. That's the word of the day for today, assiduously. assiduously. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what I found was Mexico, which is common knowledge, is, is the number one silver mining producing country in the world. And last year, they led the world in silver mining production in a year in which global silver mining production rose 2.1% and according to the Silver Institute to about 886 million ounces. Now, Mexico produced about 190 million of those ounces. The number two top silver mining country in the world was Peru. Now, Peru had a big increase in um, silver mining production. They were up 13 million ounces or more than 10% on their production in 2014. And when you take Mexico and Peru together, Rory, they account for 36.7% of total global mining production in in 2015. So you think about them, those two countries control 40% almost of the silver mining production in the world. The third is our friends in China. They produced about 110 million ounces. Now, China, as you know, that silver doesn't leave China. Ever. So basically, you can remove from the 886 million ounces a year that are mined or that were mined in 2015 and bring that down about 786, right? Because you're not getting that. The fourth largest silver mining country, Russia, with about 50 million ounces. And again, probably precious little of that leaves uh, Russia. So if you take Russia and China out of the equation, now basically, you know, Mexico and Peru have about half of the global silver mining production. So basically, 
Mexico and Peru have half the silver mining production available for the rest of the world. And then after that, it gets pretty small. Uh, Australia is fifth with about 50 million. Chile comes in at about 48 million. Bolivia around the same. Poland around the same. The United States has about 42, 45 million. And Argentina has about the same. So, but if you take the top 10, including Russia, China, um, Mexico, and, and so on, it's almost like the 80-20 rule, because after that, the top 10 silver mining p- countries that we just listed produce 83% of global silver mining production in 2015. Wow. So, so basically, and if you strip out Russia and China, exactly, and you got Mexico and Peru, <laughs> the next thing, you're, you know, you're relying on uh, Australia, Chile, Bolivia, Poland, U.S., and Argentina in very diminishing order. Now, after that, the numbers 11 to 20... They're in, almost insignificant. You got Guatemala, Kazakhstan, Sweden, Canada, which is in the 20 million ounces, which doesn't really cover much. It doesn't even cover, uh, you know, maple leaves. Than, maple leaves are half of the U.S. Men production. India has some Indonesia, Morocco, Turkey, Dominican Republic, and Armenia. But again, these are all in amounts that are, you know, between seven and 25, 30 million. Not that much coming out of them. And clearly, India. While it has some mining production, doesn't have enough um, domestic mining production to cover its 275 million ounces that it consumed last year. So basically, if you take India's, you know, just India's demand, uh, you need Peru and Mexico to cover that almost because, you know, (laughs) Mexico is 190 million ounces and and Peru is about 140 million ounces. There's not much left after that. Uh, Not Uh, too much. And then you have the rest of the demand. So as I mentioned, and I do study this stuff assiduously, but I can't figure out where the silver comes from because if you just take what they show you in these countries uh, that's being produced and then you match it up against the demand by anyone's measure, the demand outstrips the supply. And you know, the, the one place it could come from, Rory, is always scrap. But as we were talking about anecdotally and also according to – the numbers they do, there isn't any scrap coming onto the market because silver's cheap and it's just not worth selling at this price. Correct. So and it, and it won't until it gets no. until it gets back, you know, probably above twenty, mid twenties, and forget having any real volume of scrap coming back in. Right. So basically the what what I learned from the review of the silver mining countries is that it's consolidated mostly in for, for export in Mexico and Peru. China, they're the f- number one and two. China and Russia are uh, third and fourth. And then after that, none of the countries produce more than 58 million ounces. And then when you get into out of the top 10, there's not much there at all because the top 10 countries produce almost 85% of the silver. I mean, it just it seems like to me that it takes basically – Russia, I'm not Russia, it basically takes Mexico and Peru just to satisfy the 275 million ounces that India required last year. And then Mm -hmm. if you add the 47 million eagles that were sold, now you're talking about 300 million ounces. And now there's, there's really only what 50 million ounces left out of the, out of, all of Mexico and Peru's production for the rest of the world. For the rest of the world. And, and by the way, China, even though it produces, you know, that almost hundred million ounces, that doesn't cover their needs. They're still importing silver. Not only are they importing silver, they're importing Doré and which has silver in it. Well, that's all that I mean. They're, you know, they're trying to bring on a uh, hundred gigawatts of solar power by mm-hmm. twenty twenty. That yep. requires. Tons of silver, literally tons of silver. India the same. India the same. It comes back to my favorite question of all Where time. Is Where is the metal coming from? I mean, it just it just doesn't exist. But enough of my well, obviously, obviously it does though. See, that's where we're all we're, we all don't know the answer. You cannot just say, well, there's a deficit, and there's been a deficit for 15, 20 years. And that's impossible. The silver is actually showing up somewhere. And the best thing about silver, it's different than gold, 
we know, other than maybe the, the ETF may not have the silver, but we know when they produce the coins, they have to use the silver. And in the industry, they use the silver. So that is silver that physically exists. It's not made up silver. It's not made up demand. It's actual demand that is only uh, satisfied through physical delivery. Correct. There's nano silver now that they say can be used for – you ever see those flexible screens? They make those, those uh, portable laptops yep. that you can fold up. Well, yep. Apparently, if you use silver nano particles in there, it works really well. So they think that that might be another uh, new demand for, for silver. I don't know how much silver, but it, it looks like a, a promising area. I was going to say, I mean, that would that could get crazy volume quick mm -hmm. because, I mean, if all of a sudden, if that's the new thing, if that's the new iPhone or right. the new this or the new got to have, then, oh, my, my. And why wow. would you want to have that? Why wouldn't you? It's Stone Age. It's like walking around with a stone tablet versus something you can fold up and put in your pocket. Yeah, or something that you drop and it doesn't break. Exactly, exactly. So, so that could be a, a big area as well. That, that could be huge. And what about the uh, top silver uh, miners? You got almost the same dynamic. First of all, they're going to be in Mexico, right? You right. got the same dynamic in that there's consolidation, and it's getting more. But here's, here's the most interesting thing I found. There was an increase in silver mining production um, in 2015, and that was like 2.1%. But the top 20 silver mining companies as a group, their output was up 5%. Okay. And, uh, which, which means that the little guys had trouble keeping up. But the bigger ones that were more, they're better financed, had bigger minds, they were able to pull low-hanging fruit in order to kind of try to stay on the treadmill and, and uh, continue to earn revenue even at the lower price. So they were lucky enough to have reserves and money so they could produce more to meet the demand as the price dropped, hurting you know, their, their finances. They are able to stay afloat by increasing output. Now, the smaller ones, they didn't increase their output. Yeah, and they, the, um, they, it sounds like they would have had to have either shut down, slowed down, or something happened to their production because if you if you you said the top ten had a five percent increase? The top ten silver mining companies increased production by four point seven and then the uh the top twenty silver mining production you take them all was increased to six point two percent. Oh so, okay. Uh, but 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 that was driven by a 6.2% increase in the top secondary silver mining companies. So what was interesting was the primary silver mining companies only saw a collective increase of 2.3%. The bulk of that was in the, you know, the, the, the top 10, but the real increase came from silver as a byproduct, is a 6.2% increase. Hmm. Which, which I found interesting because I thought that those miners were the ones that were uh, hurting the most, but they were probably doing exactly the same thing as copper, lead, and zinc prices went down. They were also probably producing like mad, which meant they also produced a lot of extra silver um, as a byproduct. Yep. So if you were a primary silver mining company and you were small, you just couldn't do it. But if you're one of these larger companies that kind of had to do it because you had large debt obligations or maybe you got your, your lender to give you some relief as long as you kept your revenues coming in, they had to go into overtime to produce these large amounts. So the number one silver mining company in the world is in Mexico, and it was Fresnillo, and they had an increase. They produced about uh, 40 million uh, ounces, which again, for one silver company, that's a lot, but it doesn't um, – it's not that much. But again, the top ones did increase their output. But here's where it gets interesting. If you take the top 10 silver mining companies, they were about 35% of total global output. They produced 308 million of the 886 million ounces. And then the top 20 produced about 51%. So it's not quite as concentrated by as the countries were, but the companies are pretty concentrated and I could imagine, Rory, and you probably could too, you're going to see some M&A here where these companies are going to control more and more a percentage of silver, which 
the supply chain gets it gets riskier because the the greater the concentration is in particular miners, the greater the risk is that one of them goes bankrupt, and then that that supply just gets cut off. So it's already concentrated, meaning that now fifty one percent of the global output came from uh, these top twenty companies. You know as these top 20 companies start to pick up the pieces of the smaller companies and move them in to their company, even though they're not necessarily doing very well, they all could go bankrupt. Not all of them, but I mean, some of them can go bankrupt, which would disrupt the supply. Similarly, if the, if the secondary producers, if you don't get the rebound in copper, lead, and zinc, they can go bankrupt as well. And then you won't have that secondary supply come to market either. Yeah, I would think that the secondary... Uh, supply mines are at much greater risk at, as of today because mm-hmm. of the copper, lead, and zinc situation with the global slowdown in manufacturing and housing and uh, all of it. I mean, they can only high grade their mines for so long. They can only dig out, you know, additional um, ore for so long before it becomes a situation where it's not profitable, where an, or, or silver begins to move up and they're able to continue fueling the fire through the through their uh, silver mining. Mm-hmm. You know, but as far as copper, as far as the base metals are concerned, forget it. I mean, unless something changes fairly quickly, or unless China and Russia and the one one belt one road situation completely changes everything on the manufacturing side then then those then the base metals are done i mean they're they're done they're well if gonna... they are where the the question where the silver came from in 2015 the big increase came from production of silver as a secondary byproduct a 6.2% increase that drove the 2.1% increase with silver coming from secondary mines. And what you're saying is we can't count on that continuing. That's correct. That's not going to continue. Uh, not, not from my perspective. Disagree. I mean, Glencore is one of the, um, the companies. They were the fourth largest silver mining producer. Now, they're not a primary silver miner, but you see they, they put themselves in fourth through secondary mining. And in fact, only three of the top 10, four of the top 10 silver, uh, top silver producing companies are primary, um, they consider them primary silver mining companies. The other six are uh, secondary producers. Well, been speaking once again, Louis Camarasano, smallgold.com. Louis, this is becoming a regular thing with us. I'm enjoying it. Thank you very much for having me on. I appreciate your insights and, and your hosting me on the show. No, I'm loving it, dude. This is uh, I'm glad that we're doing it because I think it's, I think the people are responding well, and I like doing it. You're a good guy. I like your analysis, so it's all good. Oh, great, thanks, Rory. Well, and uh, we will pick it up again. I'm not. I can't remember when we're scheduled again, but I'll take uh, a look next at the- week to do the. Um- Russian and Chinese, I believe. The Russian and Chinese and Indian gold numbers. Oh, that's right. The uh, the national gold numbers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What they're what they're looting from the mines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the other thing to mention is the Western the the bank the ICBC Standard Bank of China, the largest bank in China, purchased Barclays London Gold Vault. Two thousand ton about- gold vault. Yes. Yes. So they're buying, and they already own the world's largest gold vault that's mm-hmm. uh, under J.P. Morgan or the Federal Reserve there in New York. And they're by, also, old, by, olding the, by owning the building, is that it? Yes, that is correct. So that's uh, follow what the wealthy people, if you do what the wealthy people are doing, then you have a better chance of being wealthy yourself. And right exactly. now, the Chinese are the ones that have all the wealth, <laughs> and that's and this is what and what are they doing? They're buying gold vaults. <laughs> yeah, you know what they're not buying, Rory? They're not buying GLD. <laughs> they're not buying treasuries either. <laughs> no, 
they, we can go through that too. I have some charts on their treasury sales and then charts on their um, gold reserve acquisitions. Yes. I'm sure they'll. I'm sure they'll will line up quite nicely. <laughs> uh, well, we'll talk with you next week, there, Lewis, and you have a Excellent, wonderful Rory. weekend. And I certainly appreciate all the time and all the knowledge. Thank you very much, Rory. <laughs>